for me, having goals, both short and long term, provided a, a path for me to have a bit more clarity. You know, a lot of people create goals as kind of like a torturing mechanism to beat themselves up. But I create goals in order to win and to create goals in which I can see a path as to, you know, structuring my thoughts. Hey guys, it's Matt Haycox here. And today I have got with me Leonard Sekionda. Now, Leonard has faced many, many frustrations through his life, including the death of his father, experiencing a serious eye condition as a child. He's been involved in gangs as a teen. He's dropped out of college. He's even seen his friend stabbed in front of his eyes. But despite these challenges, Leonard set up multiple international businesses. He's now an author, he's traveled the world, and he's now passionate about helping others to pivot their frustrations into positive growth and opportunity. Also, since then, Leonard's co-founded a tech startup called My Come Up uh, in early 2009. Uh, My Come Up World is a social network that matches freelancers, entrepreneurs, and creatives, and it now boasts over 127,000 global users. He has his own podcast. He also now has his own exclusive webinar series in which participants learn practical business advice, tips, mindset, motivation, and success. And Leonard's goal now is to use his story of race, identity, frustration, rejection, and failure as an example of how to transform frustration and pain into positive growth. Now, I know a lot of my audience, um, you know, message me every day to, you know, telling me the various pains that they're they're struggling from, you know, obviously not necessarily completely parallel to, to, to some of the background that Leonard talks about. But you know, any kind of pain and frustration that can be pivoted into positivity and entrepreneurialism, I'm sure, is the kind of stuff that Leonard's going to talk to us about. I've just realised I've had so much to say about you, Leonard, that we're, we're almost out of time. <laughs> what, what, what? Thank you for that introduction. It's really, it's a really nice introduction. <laughs> Listen, thanks for being here, buddy. Uh, and yeah, I guess, I guess let's let's go back to the beginning, really, and 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 t- you know, t- tell tell us about your background. And I think normally when I ask people to start from the beginning and talk about the background I'm, I'm, re- I'm really just wanting to set the scene and contextualize themselves for where where they are today but I think with you I'd, I'd kind of like to understand your mindset shifts as, as you go along as well you know I mean obviously yeah. you know, being a gang member you know what, what you know watching somebody you know be stabbed etc uh, you know I'm interested to know kind of where your head was you know were you happy being in a gang at the time you then did you did you sometime make a mindset shift and realize it wasn't a good thing to be in a gang or we you know we doing things against your will so uh yeah go go for it my man yeah so so uh just to kind of touch on the the, the start i think for me when i initially started my my journey it was a very uh small um perspective that i held in regards to the world society what was out there and the environment which I grew up in, uh, having lost my dad when I was eight years old, was um, in the, in London, we have the council estates. It was more of a council benefit kind of system. So that environment was conducive to people that were more on the lower end of the economy. And that kind of reflected the people I was associating with as a young, as a young kid and a teenager. I think for me, um, the, the thing about my eye condition is that I used to have to go to the hospital um, pretty much two times a week um, because I had bike, uh, spokes around my eyes um, which they were investigating. They couldn't tell if it was going to turn me blind or if I need, if they needed to put me on steroids. So my attendance was horrible. Like I I think when it came to the end of the year, I, um, I really had bad attendance. So when I actually applied for secondary schools, no schools accepted me. So I actually went to the worst secondary school you can go to in london at the time it was a school you go to when you don't get into any any when your grades are low and basically all the kids that have been like excelled or been you know bad end up going and my reason was not because of my ability but actually because of my my uh, attendance score so i kind of uh was automatically in an environment where i knew my intelligence was more but my circumstance put me in it so i was never proud about going to this school i was never an advocate of going to a school which was beneath my intelligence but it was just a circumstance and if i'm honest when you're you know you, when how old was i when you're 12 13 you're not sitting there thinking about cal- collecting all of your doctor's letters to give in to help your attendance level so it wasn't something that i was seeing as uh, at some point going to become a consequence but as a qu- consequence of it I found myself in an environment which was very hostile um, we were in a school which I think kind of congregated some of the uh, most affected kids um, in the South London region and I think the, the cause of that were a lot of the students who were coming from backgrounds where 
you know, they were living with their grandma or they had come from Jamaica or come from Africa or, you know, you had uh, Bangladesh kids that had been coming from um, from Pakistan as well. So it was like, it was a real cultured, but at the same time, very empty um, emotional um, schooling environment where I think people were all expressing themselves with anger and with rage. And for me, my initial kind of uh, step into essentially trying to not, be involved in the gang side of you know the, the the gang side of life but it was to kind of protect myself i think was i went down the music avenue which was to mc and that was a place where i found myself being able to flourish and you know still become popular and build my my reputation in the school but as as every musician does he creates a group and you know in some instance that group can become a band i think in our scenario it became more of a gang because you know, music and uh, groups and groups of angry kids become a gang very quickly. So it was always kind of playing the fine line between, you know, trying to be creative, but having this group of friends, which were half of them were musicians and the other half were, you know, involved in, you know, the other part of, 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 of that environment. And I think for me, I always danced in between the logic of knowing, because I've, I've always known better. I was, I, I can't, I can't, you know, identify, I couldn't identify per se with, logic uh not coming into play whenever i did some things because my mom didn't raise me in that in that way our, our environment was hostile but she always raised me with ethics and morals so even when things were happening around me and i was seeing things happen i never once uh, once agreed to it. and i think my my form of creating a path and confidence and my own identity was through the music so i was building a good reputation as a musician and going on shows like tim westwood but I, I think inevitably it still kept circling back to it being around, you know, gang area fights and, and wars and stabbing. So I kind of felt that the whole energy of that environment for me was very hostile. I, I, I made it through my GCSEs last minute by a teacher actually helping me out and, and realizing that I had more in me and, and basically pulling me to the side and starting to do, he started to, 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 to do extra evening classes with me. I mean, I mean, at, at this point, you know, what what were you thinking your future was? You know, I mean, did, you know, was there a was there a career or path you were going down, or were you just going through the motions? It's a good, it's a good question. I mean, for me at the time, I always knew I was special. I've never not known. I've never not known in my heart that that there was something I'm supposed to do that's big. And I think if I look at the time or the the the, the period I was in then, I think I was probably thinking I was going to be the next big musician, the be the next big music artist, I think. And I put up all of my passion into that because I wasn't just imagining or dreaming this was going to happen. I was writing songs every evening in the night. I was going home. I was finding, using every pocket money I had to go to the studio. I was, you know, messaging all my favorite music artists that I loved and, and messaged them every day. So I did... I. I've always had a, a compulsive element to me when I get involved in things. So as far as it goes with what I was doing in the music side of things, even though there wasn't really money in music at that time, especially in the grime scene, that, that was the actual environment, the music genre, I was still very much active and I was 15, 16 and, and I was doing things which people were surprised by because I was even taking trains to West London and doing songs with other musicians. So I was essentially networking as well, like a business person. So I, 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 I wholeheartedly believe that that's where I was going. Um, but then when I looked deeper into the scenario and realized what, 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 what kept happening while I was doing it, I realized that um, this was going to be something which could also involve me in having to get deeper into the dark side of, you know, the music industry and the, and, and the environment of, of areas and gang wars. And, and I think it just got to a point that even when I thought I was doing something to escape it, it was still my popularity almost heightened the chances of me being attacked or being threatened by different areas, which then made you have to associate yourself with other people that could protect you. So it's almost like a layer cake, right? You, 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 you come out of it, you come out of your environment, which is school, which is your area, to go into something which is creative, which still has an element of making you popular, which allow, which enables you to basically be a, a target and, and you need people to protect you in that target. So I feel like that was something that I personally felt that um, created a space for me to realize that I had to to think a little bit beyond um, uh, that being a career, at least for my safety, should I say? Because there was no money being made, so it's more more popularity and 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 increasing my my risk at the time being exposed and popular. 
Um, and when, when did you first, I mean, I was going to say, you know, when do you first move into business? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the music side of things was probably uh, un, un, unintentionally, like you say, unintentionally business orientated, you know, with, with the skills like networking, etc. You know, when, when, did, when did you make, make that you know, formal decision to, I guess, you know, leave, you know, gang life behind, you know, leave the music behind and yeah. go, go more mainstream? Yeah, so I mean, what, what made what made the change? You know, what was funny? It was funny because um, I remember at the time I got a part time job when I, as I said, the teacher helped me to get through GCSEs, and I just got into a sixth form. Don't know how I did it, but I got in. Um, um, and I remember when I got there, I used to have plaits and I used to have like earrings, and I still had the kind of cadence of my old younger self. And I remember I got a part time job working for like a tele sales company called Vo for Voxel. So we customer service up asking them if they got their brochure, how they find it. It was quite interesting. But anyway, I remember being so dedicated at that job because I wanted to kind of make some money on the side. And a woman gave me the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And at the same time as this happening, I had a friend of mine who is my best friend now, who was also kind of going into like investment broking at the time. And he was making money and he was, he was really big on all these uh, motivational CDs like Zig Ziglar and motivational things like that. And it kind of like worked simultaneously. Like he was informing me about the motivational side. And then this woman just came over while I was working was like, you need to read this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I read. And I found myself, you know, in, in, for the first time reading something which talked to me as a human. It talked to me outside of my race, outside of my experience. It kind of provided me with other options. I wasn't taught that I could be an investment, a property investor. I wasn't taught that I could be self-employed. I was only taught I could either be an A, B or C student. And I was only taught that I could either be a doctor, policeman, lawyer. You know, I was never taught the other options. And I feel like the moment that book gave me the quadrants and gave me these other options, which to me had never existed, I was like, well, hold on, I can actually do this. So my first mission was to get a job in to a, in a state agency, and I didn't feel that you had form out because after reading that book, I was just dead certain that I was going to get my first job in the real estate because uh, I just read about it. And it was in 2008 slash nine when that big recession was happening, so it was a challenging task to get a job. But after like four to five rejections, I borrowed another suit from a friend to kind of improve my chances, and ended up getting a job in lettings in uh, in uh, Mitram, which was still 40 minutes from my house, but I was so um, eager to get the job. And getting into that company enabled me to really learn from the ground up, you know, how the lettings and the sales business works. And for me, having read this book, which was talking about, you know, making opportunities in a bad market, and it was talking about cynics and people being negative and watching people's energies. When I went into the work environment, I remember coming in enthusiastic and ready to like, you know, improve myself and people telling me to calm down that I'm young, but I kind of put it to the side and, and, I, and I mastered a way of actually beating everybody result wise and actually making the company more business because at the time where the recession was really, you know, I'm sure you remember it all over the news. It was, you know, it was, it was horrible red lines, recession prices going down. We used to have landlords calling every day. In fact, like every other hour, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And I remember, my job was to be in letting. So I remember telling, thinking in my head that this was an opportunity. So I tested out with two landlords and actually offered to rent their properties out for them instead of selling them. But in fact, what I said to them is, is that they should rent their properties for anything from two to three years instead of the standard 12 months. And I got two to agree to do it. I found tenants that wanted to have security for two to three years and ended up doing two uh, two deals, which enabled me to get to get the commission of a, of a, of a sales contract because I was getting you know, more than a 12 month commission, I was getting it for three years. And just like that, I, you know, broke records, I, I, I started to make money, I'm, I'm 19 now, I've showed the business how to even make more money in this scenario. And we started to do these long term contracts with um, properties. And, and I remember, you know, demanding for them to promote me because even though I was 18 slash 19, I was blurred between 18 and 19. I remember them not being quite hesitant. So I made up this predicament and said, a company offered me a job which I hadn't and I said I don't get a, pr a promotion I'm going to leave and I remember them essentially they 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 came up with the offer I said they're going to give me a car and a pay rise but that didn't happen they gave me a little bit of a pay rise and no car and the worst thing you can do to an 18 slash 19 year old is promise him a car and him not get it so 
it was that day that I decided that I'm going to leave this company and start my own one. So I, I had saved up some money and I started my first, I got, I got a workspace, which was in um, South Wimbledon. It's kind of like an excellent building and set up my first estate agency called Key Move Relocations, Key Move Estate Agents. That was my first business. And it came, like I said, once. And, and if you look at the, the, the flow of everything, it's always been frustration. I was frustrated at the time. When, and I know I brought all this value to this business. I had been enthusiastic and shown the same person that told me to calm down and that I was being over, over the top. I'd shown him how to increase his commissions through the new method that I, I brought to the business. Yet, because of my age, they didn't want to promote me. It was very clear that I was the leader. I was the teacher. I was helping everyone. And that frustration, I just, instead of, you know, sitting there and mulling around and minimizing my value, I, 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 I took my value elsewhere and gave it back to myself. So, so obviously, you, you know, you've you've taken frustration in a in a very in a very positive way, and 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 obviously, it's, you know, it's done great things for you for your life. I guess, yeah, you know, the the stereotype, or, or probably probably the you know the majority of frustrated people pro probably don't get to use that frustration in 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 a, in a positive way. You know, they they either you know live a life of let's say best case, live a life of grumpiness and irritated and and, and regret because you know they're, they're frustrated at being able to able to uh, move things forward, or potentially you know p p p people from uh, you know from a worse background use that frustration mm -hmm. and go off in complete and completely the other direction and. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to turn to lives of crime and, and, yeah. and certainly not positive things ha, ha, you know in terms of actual tactics techniques you know methodology ha, how, how are you using your experience now mm -hmm. to you know, to help to help people who are suffering uh, frustration and take it in a positive manner and, uh, and and not not let things go wrong very very good, very good question Matt. Yeah, and it's true um, and I saw it firsthand people that were frustrated using that energy and and using it to harm people and as I got older, I've seen people use that same energy and use it to sabotage themselves, whether that's through drugs, whether that's through alcohol, whether that's through depression. And one of the things that I, I, I learned along the way, especially when I was first, because I think my initial uses of the frustration, it was productive, but at the same time, it was still very dis um, disruptive because it was frustration without structure. It was just, I want more. I didn't know what more I wanted. I just wanted more. And I think when I first started to attain more, I realized that if I don't have a plan, on what it is I want to see over the next uh, three to four to five years, then if money is my goal, when I get the money, who am I gonna be? And that, that started to happen, play out. So what I learned was the power of goal setting. And for me, having goals, both short and long-term, provided uh, a path for me to have a bit more clarity. In a book I read, which was called Psycho-Cybernetics, um, which kind of broke down the psychology of, um, about uh, the psychology of goals and how you know a lot of people create goals as kind of like a torturing mechanism to beat themselves up but i create goals in order to win and to create goals in which i can see a path as to you know structuring my thoughts because a lot of us feel anxiety and a lot of us feel strain less less because of us being you know unworthy enough but really being unclear or not having a real direction and what goal setting has done and what i've really mastered over the past few years is creating clear uh, incremental goals that affect different areas of my life, have goals that are to do with my love life, my relationships, have goals that are to do with my spirituality and my health, have goals to do with my finances, I have goals to do with my friends and family. So it's not just goals which are stimulated off, you know, one trajectory of myself, but it's just monitoring each of these flows and evaluating them at least once a year to see how they've played out and being okay for them to change and adjust throughout the year because you know, it's, it, like I said, it's not a disciplinary act. It's more about creating some form of clarity because I feel like life without the clarity enables there to be an uncertainty, which people then end up, you know, self-harming, sabotaging, or falling into mental health, uh, health issues, which and in the long run have a negative effect on, on people. And what, what's your advice to people in general in, ter in terms of goal settings? I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, a question that you know a, a, a lot of people have have a lot, a lot of different answers on uh, i mean i, I mean I, I for one am I'm very much into into stretch goals um but uh, you know you know something that's let's say a tight <laughs> A stretch, but still attainable. Attainable to some degree. Obviously, other people advocate for setting fucking mental goals. You know, so that even if you shoot for the stars, you know, and you, and you fail dramatically, you're still halfway in the sky. I mean, what 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 are some of your specific tech, you know, techniques yeah, and tactics on goal setting? Good, good question. So I, I actually have a book uh, that I released last year called "Become Your Own Hero Again," 
Um, it's on Amazon, it's become a bestseller. And it, I actually have an exercise in there that breaks down goals and how to actually write them from short to long term. And the okay. reason I did that is because I felt that this is something that people can add to their day-to-day -day lives. Because goals, like you mentioned, are about winning as opposed to setting a bar that is pretty much impossible to hit. I believe in incremental success and success being if my goal was to go for a run three times a week, being able to say to myself that I wrote it, did it and achieved it and then moving accordingly with that win to actually progress into setting high levels of goals. But I think a lot of people tend to kind of set goals as this this benchmark as opposed to really what goes on in the, on the day to day life. If that if you start setting food goals to cutting out a certain kind of, you know, uh, chocolate or, you know, fried food for that week and you start to see you, you wrote it as a goal and you uh, achieve it, you start to create what you call internal confidence. And for internal confidence, that's where you can shoot and aim higher. Like, I call it like the swimming pool effect. When we, if you go to a pool and you have no swimming experience, you just dive in. It's not the fact that you can't swim, but that you're not confident enough to swim. So starting at the shallow end and learning to have the confidence to go in with the arm, arm bands and then to slowly take the arm bands off and then to do that halfway of the pool to the point that you get the confidence internally to know that you can keep yourself above the water when you get to the deep end. And that's what I see goals as. It's not about the ability, but it's about the confidence. So it's just about creating those internal um, moments within yourself where you start to trust yourself because half of us are slowed down by the perception. Well, no, most of us are slowed down by the perception we have of ourselves. And when we start to be aware of what we're actually capable of, when we become aware that we're able to say, this time, this week, I'm gonna work out three times. And I, and I did it. I'm not saying how long. I'm not saying this week, I'm gonna work out three times and do 100 kg each time. Each workout can be 10 minutes, but you said you're gonna do three workouts you know, this week and you did three 10 minute workouts and you and yourself know you said it and you did it. And I think that's what it's about, creating that flexibility of just being able to start saying things and, and then achieving them. And then saying to yourself, I said that I did it and I achieved it. And using that as your confidence to move forward into the deeper waters of the goals or the aspirations that you wanna achieve later on. So I believe in incremental goal setting. Of course, I love the idea, and I do mention about affirmations in my book, I love the idea of dreaming and imagination and, and, and having a, a place where you do have your wildest thoughts, but it's impossible to imply your to include your wildest thoughts in your day-to-day -day activities at the same time. It's great to have a, a page that you go in and you visualize for the next five years your greatest life. So you know, so, so you can start to feel it. But then when we go into the goals and the practical steps we do, we start to make them incremental so that you can actually apply it immediately and not, you know, when you have that pool at the back of the house or the yacht or the jet that's outside. Yeah. Uh, so it's very, very good, very interesting. I just want to um, bring a question in from uh, from one of the guys watching online, uh, Yasir on Facebook. I don't know if you can. See, I don't know if your system shows you the comments as well. No, but, it doesn't. Oh, maybe it does. um, so. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yasir said, I learned a lot about business watching movies about the mob. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I guess. Um, I, I guess um, your bio's up, up up on the Facebook here as well for for anybody who's, who's joined late. But uh, uh, Leonard Leonard Leonard's background is is as uh, you know someone who was in a gang in in, in his in his younger years and has uh, you know turned that frustration into positive energy and and is a very successful entrepreneur author, author um, you know multiple uh, business owner right now. Um, I, mean, I mean, what kind of what kind of lessons would you say? Uh, you know, following on from your serious comment about about yeah. mob, uh, you know, what kind so, of if, if, I, if I'm honest with you, I wouldn't say that the, if I'm uh, looking back at my, my young years, it wasn't as, as organized. But I would definitely say that I've learned a lot from reading, watching mob movies and the organization uh, and the structure and the discipline and the hierarchy of their of their operations. Not the actual distribution of what it is, but there are a lot of ethics outside of the uh, internal, internal ethics amongst the, the organizations. And if you look at America, it's built by the mob. So it's undeniable to say that there are not things that can be learned from the infrastructure and the uh, arrangement of some of these organizations. However, um, it's not just that. I think it's, I think everyone has a bit you can learn from. You know, you can learn from Mike Tyson, who was a, you know, a heavyweight champion and look at his discipline. You can learn from, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, who, do, who does method acting. You know, there's so many elements you can take from people, but it's not just about learning, it's about what can you actually take and apply to life. If you're gonna learn from the mob, 
what specifically uh, can you apply into your life? What is, is that a characteristic? Is that a discipline? Is that an efficiency? Is that a, is that they build it? The, the, I mean, I love the, the fact that the mob were able to have a vision to, to go into Vegas and build that into, an, into a city which now is owned by the Mormons, but it initiated through the mob. So it was more than the crime. It was actually a lot of um, expansion and, uh, and, and diversification in their operation which someone like the Trump, I remember re watching recently that the Trump also went on to license his name to them, um, the Italian mobs that I'm talking about. So yeah, I think there is a lot of, um, there's a lot that can be learning through everyone. Humans are the biggest, you know, teacher in general, but it's about what what specific part of, uh, of, their, of their characteristic you can apply to yourself. Because there are some things that the mob could do that I would just wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't do. Hundred percent. I mean, I, you know, I, I, talk, I talk about this a lot. You know, when when, I, when I'm talking to people about about finding mentors, and you know, and and people ask, you know, where do I go and find one, or who who should I find? And you know, and and for, and for me, you know, it, it, like you say, it's very much about finding the right people for the right circumstances, and 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 uh, or, or or for the right teaching lessons. Let's say, you know, and 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 that's that. What you should certainly not be doing is is excluding the good from people or from teaching experiences just because of the, some some of the, some of the bad you know some some of the bad in there you know um, you know if, if if you want to learn tennis for example then then you want to go and have you know the best person to teach you that tennis that doesn't mean that same person's qualified to teach you about football or business or ethics or or mathematics or whatever it may be but you know it's, you know, it's about you know like you say taking the right lessons take learning from the people that uh, that you re resonate with you uh, and and then applying them to your specific situations because because me personally Matt I've always been intrigued with leaders and uh one, one thing I did you find myself especially at a time when i first started the business i never had examples of you know this being a, a cool thing to do i think when i was 18 you know the likes of richard branson and alan sugar were more the figures of, of entrepreneurism so it was more of a senior thing so for me especially coming from the adversities i that i had gone through one of the things i did to neutralize a lot of my uh, feelings towards what i'd gone through was reading about you know great leaders like the napoleon bonapartes and the uh, Alexander the Great, and you know, I was really, I've always been intrigued with generals and how they've been able to lead uh, uh, armies and, and and soldiers to conquer and to strategize the takeovers of countries. And I think one of the great things about um, generals like uh, that have lived before us is that you can see a lot of traits in how they've been able to persuade and lead people. I even read the Hitler book to understand how he managed to convince a whole country to, to, to behave in such a way. So I think being, being you have life is about being subjective. Even if the views are against what you believe, there's always something you can understand more. And there's always something, and especially if it's history, history is, is it's really, I mean, there are parts that are alive, but there are still evidence as to someone got away with doing that. But understanding the how can be something that you can use for your company that you're doing one day and being a, a stronger leader in that format with for good um in, in as opposed to for bad so yeah that was something that i've always been and just and, and just uh, let's let's talk a little bit about about the current situation I mean, how, how's your business been affected by by corona you know i, I mean you're an online business anyway so uh, i guess you know we were, were you already reasonably adapted or you know have you have you got not things really that, because not, not really because now um i think I think now my, for my business, I'm, my goal is to create more value. And I've realized that over the past you know, year or two, a lot of people have become a lot more prone to learning online and really wanting to get more than you know, information or more than networking. A lot of people want to understand firsthand how they can improve their sales skills, how they can improve their confidence and how they can really you know, put their brand or their business in a much more stronger uh, position. So what we've been doing, uh, of course, is, um, Adv advancing some of the services we provide with my come up so we are introducing a, a learning platform uh, within the platform which is going to enable people to actually take and be part of uh, groups and courses which are designed to helping them to increase their clarity financial stability and also give them some guidelines on how they can apply and improve their personal growth so what we've been doing is actually working on giving more value and creating more of a support and an intimate experience as opposed to just leaving it as a social network. So over the next coming uh, month, we're gonna be introducing the e-learning uh, element of the platform, which I feel like is gonna be a great thing for people that have either 
you know, been out of work for a while and lost confidence, or for those that have businesses that really want to understand how they can generate new leads, how they can assume the position of clarity in their life, and at the same time learn from coaches and support people that are there for them along the journey. Fantastic. Well, listen, it's been fantastic having you here, buddy. Uh, I mean, for, 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 the, for the guys at home, do, do you want to you give yourself a little plug of, of what, where they can find you if they want to hear more, uh, where yeah. they can find your book, you can find you on YouTube, etc. Yeah, yeah. You can find me online um, uh, on Instagram, which is at leonardsekionda.com. Uh, that's L-E-O-N-A-R-D-S-E-K-Y-O-N-D-A. Um, I'm also on YouTube. If you search Leonard Sekionda, I have vlogs, I have podcasts that are on there. You can go to leonardsekionda.com to keep updated. I'm on my come up as well, mycomeup.com, if you search my name inside the platform. And uh, on Amazon, you can search Leonard Sekionda, Become Your Own Hero Again, and get a copy of my book. And I can assure you that it will help you with the principles as well as the actual exercises to create more structure and just create more clarity. And I'm always here for feedback and for any questions that you have around the book or some of the topics I talk about. Fantastic. Well, listen, thanks again, Leonard. And uh, you know, thanks for taking ta- time out during what is uh, undoubtedly a, a, busy t- a busy time for a, for, a, for a busy guy. So uh, I appreciate, appreciate you being here, mate. Thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate Thank you me. having me on your show. Love what you're doing. Thank you. Bye-bye.